Now we go to the Word of God. And tonight we look at Judges chapter 16. And I only need one verse. In fact, when you read it, there will be no doubt in your mind. Judges chapter 16 and verse 20. And here is what the Bible says. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out at it as other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. I've entitled this tonight, Hanging by a Thread. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we dare not open the word of God without the power of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. So Father, send now all that we need. Send now the voice of Jesus Christ amplified by the power of his Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, that nothing in me shall hinder what Jesus has to say. Let us leave convinced that we have heard the voice of Jesus. For we pray in his name. Amen. Uh, there is this man named Samson. I, I love to preach about him because he is strong. In fact, I learned just this week that in the shades of meaning of his name, it even suggests that he is handsome, more than muscular. But the way his body is built is, is accentuated by his winsomeness. I would suggest to you that he would be one that everybody would love to see. There are men who men find encouraging. They are so powerfully built that even men say, Aha, maybe I can be like that. And I have learned, I, I didn't know until I had a daughter, that you ladies say things like you say. In fact, I've come to believe that when a very handsome man enters a group, if he is beyond ordinary, women don't say much because they don't want to share what they've seen. I imagine what might have been said had Samson come to the place. Samson was called before he was born. Jesus, the angel who was the Lord, is the one who came to his mother and then to his father and said, this is what you must do. Told the mother, you have got to eat the right thing and do the right thing. Some of us forget that children are formed in their mother's womb with the traits that we pass along to them. And so, even before he was born, his mother was instructed, don't eat anything unclean, don't touch anything that is from the grape. You must live in a way that's almost like a Nazarite, because your son is called from the womb to be a Nazarite. And when he comes, he will begin to deliver Israel. Understand that when you think that hope is lost, and there are people who are always believing that there is no hope. I, I am not one of you. In fact, I, I will talk to you for a minute, but not much more, because I find myself pulled down by people who always thinks that, think that God has forgotten. God never forgets. And when you don't think he has a plan, there's a plan in the making right there. Uh, the people of this time uh, were so caught up. Uh, 40 years under the Philistines' power. And, and, and yet God had brought this young man. He was being born and reared right among them. He had the power to begin to deliver them. God had made him so. When God makes you strong, you're strong. That's why I wish we could get our eyes on it. Handsome, yes. Powerfully built. I wonder what he did when... He was a little boy. I wonder what are some of the things that gave his parents the hint that God was indeed true in what he said. 
Did he pick up things that babies couldn't pick up? When he was a teen, did he, did he have power that even made his parents wonder? Uh, there are scholars who believe that uh, the, the tribe of Dan would put together little groups to try and battle the Philistines. And, and they believe that Samson, even in his youth, was part of those bands that tried to resist. I wonder what did Samson do? Could he go sometimes and take hold of about four or five of the Philistines? And grab them at one time and squeeze them together and say good morning how are you remember he wasn't afraid of them he had looked down from from his home which was just above Timnath in fact his blessing and his curse was that he was familiar with these enemies and you got to be careful when your enemies are close by don't have a long time to talk about it but I will warn you that too much familiarity with the enemy is not good you must watch what they do but you must be aware of the dangers Samson looked down and saw very few things that frightened him and because he did he mingled freely with them his home was just above them and he could go down to Timnath and eventually you know what happened uh, among the young ladies in Timnath I have no reason to know what they looked like. But I've discovered that uh, romance does not develop based on appearance alone. And there are young ladies who don't appear to me to be attractive, but there's always some man chasing them. I scratch my head from time to time. There are young men who barely look like they can make it to me. But everywhere they go, there are 10 or 12 women following behind them. So evidently, it's not based on what you look like. There must be some other magnetisms that are at work there. But somehow, Samson goes down, forgets all the women where he lives. i got to touch that because it needs to be touched. There are some people who can't see the beauty of, of folks in God's house yes, Come on now. I don't understand that somebody from outside comes in and the whole place is astir well what I've learned is that the beauty that God gives you does not vanish uh, there are people now men and women who have learned to make themselves more attractive with things that come in jars You've seen all the shows. There are doctors who can play with your physiognomy and do things with your face and your form and make you look better than you did before. However, they say that eventually gravity still wins. <laughs> what I've discovered is that if God makes you look good, and I promise you, I have seen it. I thank God for being an evangelist. I've traveled all around the world. I have preached to people who came to hear the word of God ugly. But I sat there and watched them as God began to make them look better. I've seen men with bloodshot eyes and yellow teeth. They bent over. They looked like they could barely walk. But as they opened up the word of God, God touched them, straightened them up, cleared their eyes, brightened their teeth, put a new bounce in their step. And I would say that if you are a man who wants to look better before you go to the plastic surgeon, open up the word of God and see what God can do for you. Young lady, before you go putting things on and changing things around, let Jesus come into your heart. He's got a way of changing you from the inside. In fact, I've seen ladies who have grown old in the church and even after they are gray and wrinkled, God arranges their gray hair and puts their wrinkles in the right place so that they're still pretty. <laughs> Only God can do that. Samson goes down ignoring all the women of his tribe and all the women who loved Jehovah. And he's down in Timnath. Mercy. 
Be careful in Timnath. You don't know who you're looking at in Timnath. And he sees a woman who captures his fancy, goes back to his parents. I, I, I applaud his parents. They said to him, have you never seen anybody in our own place here? Have you overlooked everybody here? You know, I used to tell my, uh, my children when they were children. I'm technically out of the parenting business now. My children have reached the age of majority. The only thing I can do now is to give counsel and give it quietly and humbly. But in those days when I had authority over them, I used to tell them, when you go to choose somebody, if you've got to choose between somebody who is wonderfully made and somebody who loves Jesus, bring somebody plain who loves Jesus. Because the way they look will improve over time. I have counseled with people who are married to amazingly winsome people. I talked to one man whose wife would from would time to time disturb the worship service. That's how pretty she was. There were men who would try not to look. Brethren who are married understand this. You know, she's over there and you But when I talked with her husband he said to me, Pastor, there are mornings when I pray that God will hold back sunrise. Because while she looks beautiful to you, she is an ugly woman inside. And I wish that it would remain night longer so I wouldn't have to look at her face. You can't tell by the cover of a book what's inside of it. <laughs> well, I wish Samson had thought. He comes back to his parents and says, look, I, I got the woman. Samson. Samson, haven't you looked, you know that young lady, a couple, couple blocks down? I've seen her mother. She's not the one for me. But she's so sweet. <laughs> you think she's sweet. I'm looking for something else. And so his fancy is caught. He says, Father, get her for me. I'll respect you, but I will not let you affect my choice. Get the Timnath woman for me. Some things happen that I cannot linger on long, but God will always send you hints when you are going wrong. I've discovered that most people don't see the hints. God can put up billboards. And people who are intent on doing something else don't see them. Now, after it's over, they will come and say, you know, I saw so many signs. I don't know why I didn't know God was trying to talk to me. And now, here I am. I told one lady coming back to me, I said, didn't we have counsel and didn't I tell you you're going wrong? I seldom tell anybody that strong a thing. But I told you, didn't I? She said, yes, you did. But I thought you were trying to keep me from something good. Now what shall I do? Well, you know, in the back of my mind, what I want to say is you got yourself into it. But that's unkind. The woman in Timnath is there. The parents say, well, there's nothing we can do. They go down to visit. And uh, aside from this little escapade, and I, I can't get all this stuff in, but here's one. Uh, Samson is not walking now with his parents. He's kind of taken a little detour and runs into a young lion. <laughs> For you and me, that would be a very eventful moment. I have never encountered a lion face to face. I went to Africa finally enough times and, and teased them that the only wild thing I had seen in Africa was a goat. And so they got together and spirited me off after one of my meetings to a game reserve. Now in a game reserve, it's not quite like a zoo. In the zoo, you are looking at losers. These are the animals that got caught. <laughs> if you ever wonder why they look like they do, you know. <laughs> They've been caught. They lost. They think of their cousins still loose and free back in their homeland. And there you are thinking you're looking at the genuine article. You have no idea what the real animal looks like. You're looking at losers. 
So they took me through this game reserve and, and then they told me stories. They were trying to get back at me for teasing them and so they told me stories about wild animals as we sat outside looking over the savannah. And I knew what they were trying to do, but eventually they still got to me. And they said, now, Pastor, you may go to your room, get under your mosquito net, and we shall pray for you. <laughs> Late that night I heard something. It was an ungodly sound. <laughs> I have never in my life, I had never heard anything like that. It, I can't even mimic it. I didn't want to ask anybody's help because then I would seem afraid. So God and I had a talk under the mosquito net. <laughs> Eventually I got up. I said, I got to check because this thing is getting louder and maybe coming nearer. So I knocked on the door of a fellow who didn't seem to lord over me so much. And I said, He said, Pastor, that is a free lion. <laughs> a what? <laughs> it is a free lion. He said, those things you hear in America can't make that noise. They are caught. <laughs> what you hear now is a lion roaming free. He could come very close to us tonight. I said, yes. And that is the reason why I've come to your room. <laughs> Perhaps we should go into the kitchen and pray together. <laughs> this lion comes and Samson has no problem. He has no weapon. Remember, they, they are in a tense situation with the Philistines, so there's no weapon. And when the lion comes, you know, I would have been in motion in the other direction. Samson stays there and looks, look in his eyes. I'm sure the lion wondered, what is wrong with him? Finally, Samson goes over and strangles the lion, and according to one scholar, then pulls him apart by his hind legs as though he were a kid goat. And then he goes to his parents and never mentions the lion. It was not an event for him. Do you feel what's going on? <laughs> then they get to this place, and, uh, and they discover that these people are not like them. You must understand, I don't, I don't believe in discrimination. I do believe, however, that when you are about to make a contract that lasts for life, you must consider who it is with whom you're making the contract. Are we okay? You know, there are people who take more time with the decision to buy an attache case than the one that they do for choosing a mate. You get on a college campus where you can barely tell who people are. There are people who bought special clothes for now. There are people who have borrowed cars for now. There are people who have attitudes that they've put on for now. And they don't have long. Some don't intend to pursue a degree. They are pursuing you. And here you come without thinking. Samson has gone to Timnath, the woman that he must have, and when he gets there, he discovers that these people are quite different. In fact, when they finally go for the, the feast, Samson has seen again this body of the lion. Birds have picked the flesh from it. The sun has dried it, so it's no longer... Uh, looking quite like it did before. And there are bees that have made a honeycomb. Bees dislike putrefaction. They will not get near a decaying corpse, not even of a lion. But after the flesh is gone and after there's no odor of that situation, they will come and they have made inside the bones of this lion a honeycomb. Samson reaches in and gets it not supposed to eat food that comes out of a situation like that, but he's playing with all of the rules and breaks off a piece and starts eating it, goes to meet his parents and says, would you like some? Doesn't tell them where it came from. That's not nice. And they eat it with him. And as they go down to the feast, he thinks, 
Aha! In those days, it was quite popular to bring some kind of a dilemma that could not be solved, to bring a riddle that would make everybody wonder. So he comes. They have given him 30 people for his entourage. There are many things that ought to make bells ring in the back of your head. If you're going to be married, but you're the people of your, your proposed wife's country send you 30 people to be with you, that's a sign. You must never overlook that. Why are you guys, you know, why are you doing? So what are you, you going down there with me, right? Uh, can you tell me who you are? Could I know your names? Or say, well, don't worry about it. We're just with you. We are part of your body. Well, if I don't know you, you are not part of my body. But they go down with him, and after they get there, he says, I have a riddle for you. I got to make sure I get it right, because this riddle is interesting. He says, you must solve this now before we leave this particular situation. And the riddle, I think, he says, out of the eater came something to eat. And out of the strong came something sweet. And they said, okay. You think you can solve it? Of course. We'll be back with you presently. And you know what he's talking about, but they don't. And they go for three days, and then into the fourth day, they have made a wager. Do, do you see what this man of God, God has said, I will make Samson the one who begins to deliver Israel. But first of all, he chooses somebody who has no consonance with his plan or no understanding of his God. How can she help him? How can someone help forward your plans for your life if they don't even understand your God? I'm not trying to be too strict here, am I? It just doesn't make sense. And so they go and talk to her and they say, look, tell us this riddle. Because it appears that the gentleman you are about to marry wants to rip us off. We have made a wager. <laughs> you know, I don't want to stop at every one of these points, but these are signs. He says to them, if, uh, if I win, I'll give each one of you a change of clothing. I'll give you a wardrobe. But if I win, each of you must give me one. Not a bad deal. If they win, they get one apiece. If he wins, he gets 30. And they say, okay, we'll work that. By the fourth day, there's no way they can know the riddle. So they go to his proposed wife and say, Tell us what your proposed husband is talking about. And for a moment, here's another sign. If the woman you're about to marry tells your secrets to, your, to her friends, <laughs> I don't have time for that one, but you know there's some power in that. Uh, if, if, if there's more confidence between her and her people than between you and your desired one there's something wrong so on the seventh day they they get her to break and she says here it is he found a honeycomb in a lion's bones and so all he's saying is that the strongest animal there is is a lion and the sweetest thing there is is honey and if you say those two things you'll win and on the seventh day they come and say it and that's when samson should have said mom dad let's go home I have, I have been at a wedding where the bride or the groom confessed to me, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do this. I'm, I'm kind of strange. You should never ask me to do your wedding if you're going to confess something like that because it will be my intent from that moment forward to stop the wedding. In fact, I don't know whether you've ever heard about it, but on a couple of occasions, I said to a bride, take off these clothes, put on some regular clothes, and go home. She said, but what will happen? My father has spent all this money. I said, your father will forgive you. <laughs> He'd much rather spend all this money and have it go to waste than to have you unhappy for the rest of your life. So you go home. She said, well, what are you going to do? I said, you will hear about it later. <laughs> put her in a car, 
went out to the people and said, Folk, today we're going to have a wonderful party. But it will not be a wedding. These people are gone. I have sent them away. Let us go immediately to the reception. <laughs> Didn't turn out bad either. There were people who were quite happy. What I want to tell you is that God sends signs, but Samson would not see them. He marries. And then comes the strange sign. They said, I tell you what, uh, she gave us the secret. He said, I understand that you plowed with my heifer. I will not explain that if you don't understand it. Uh, that's your problem. And that's how you know my secret. Then he understands that there is some comedy going on. He goes to get these 30 changes of clothing, goes down to another city, a city of the Philistines, and somehow this man of God who potentially will deliver Israel doesn't understand that when he goes down and kills 30 people and takes their clothes to honor a wager that he's not doing anything wrong. Folk, let me tell you what I know to be true. Once you set out on a course that is against God, you are out of your mind. Join us next time on Breath of Life for more of Pastor Pearson's message on Samson. Once you set out on a course that is against God, you are out of your mind. In fact, one day when you look back on it, you will say to yourself, I was out of my mind. I should never have done that. But the course that you take away from God takes you out of your mind. And so now a strange thing has started. They find out what he did to get these clothes. They find out that there's some strange enmity that is developed. And they say, we will, we will then burn your wife and her father's house. When Samson gets disturbed, he can do things. So the first thing that he does is that he backs away from that wedding. And another person is put in his place. The father of the bride, once Samson leaves, gives another man to his daughter. Samson comes back eventually. The father says, I thought you were gone. I didn't think you would come back. So what I did, I gave your wife away to your, your best man. Why don't you take my next daughter, a younger one? He says, I don't like this plan. So when he gets disturbed about that, he goes and does something that only a powerful man can do. He goes and catches 300 jackals. Foxes, the Bible calls it. But uh, the, the scholars have discovered that foxes don't stay together in those big packs jackals do. How do you catch 300 jackals? How do you hold them when you catch them? What do you do? Grab tails and just hold them together? Well, if you're Samson, it's no problem. He catches them and then he puts firebrands between tails of two at a time and then turns them loose in the fields of corn that the Philistines depend on to eat and burns down their food supply. Folks, this is a problem. You got no more olives. You got no more corn. And, and so the people are quite angry. And when he finishes, he goes to Judah. These are people who are under the, the, the direction or under the control of the Philistines and goes to the rock Etam and goes into a cave to stay there. And after that experience, the Philistines say, where is he? And you know, you can't depend on the brethren all the time. So they say, well, we know where he is. Ask the Levites where he is. He went to their country. Okay, so they go and make a deal. They say, look, we can't go get him. You know, he's got special skills. Would you bring him out to us? And, and his brethren, 3,000 of his brethren, go to him. One of my favorite writers says that if those 3,000 people who went to deliver Samson to the Philistines had come with the, the determination to stand on God's side, 
they could have freed the people but they were so f afraid their backbones were so malleable they could barely stand so they got together and said Samson you got to go out there we, we got to take you and deliver you, say, what? <laughs> you know, forgive me but I, I see it in modern terms can you see Samson so you guys came to turn me in is that what you came to do and y'all feel pretty good about that can you sleep tonight when you turn me in they say yeah we, we can sleep tonight we're not gonna let them attack us we got friendships with these people these folk have given us peace we are not about to break up our situation for you come on we're gonna tie you up what shall we tie you with he said well you tie me with some green cord I can't break out of that and they take him to the Philistines. And they said, Samson, you're not going to kill us while we're taking you. He said, no, I don't bother you. You're already miserable enough. Come up here to deliver me instead of doing what God calls you to do. You stay in your own misery and stew in it, marinate in it. But when they get close to the Philistines, they are overjoyed. They say, hey, his own people are bringing him here. And they shout. They are so happy. And Samson comes all the way down until he gets close to him. And then he does what you suspect he's going to do. Breaks the cords and grabs the next thing he can find, which turns out to be the jawbone of a donkey. I can't imagine it doing harm to anybody unless I'm Samson. Then I can take anything. In fact, I could almost take nothing. But he takes this bone that is not dried and begins to kill people with it until a thousand of them are dead and this man is in trouble now here is what you must know Samson's vow as a Nazarite has three provisions can't approach a dead body can't take anything into his body that comes from the fruit of the grape and cannot cut his hair the scholars believe that by the time we get to this place in the story he has already had wine they believe that he has already come close to many dead bodies so the only provision he's got left is that he hasn't had his hair cut he's hanging by one-third of his vow and here is my question to you when does God cut you loose if I were God at two-thirds, I'd have cut him loose. I don't think he deserves my loyalty. I, he's no longer the man that I sent. But in that moment when he had brought that partial victory, his people made him a judge. And listen to this. For 20 years, God allowed Samson to judge Israel, that part of Israel that was within those boundaries. And then the Bible says that 20 years later, and I want to say this to you because there are some of us who have grown old, and we love to talk about the terrible things young people do. Lord, help these young people. <laughs> Where do you think they learned what they do? Oh, oh these young folks. If only God had to worry only about the young people. If only those were the only folk who, who violated his command. There are some people who have grown old who have no longer the energy to act on their evil thoughts. <laughs> Forgive me, I didn't mean to be mean-spirited. <laughs> but you still got evil intent. Man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart, so he knows. So if you have been like Samson, a good person for a long time, don't let it go to your head. Samson, for 20 years, was a judge, and then one day something started nagging at him. Went down to Gaza for no particular reason. Goes into Gaza and sees a prostitute this judge of God's house and I know folks think that all of this new stuff about holy people 
you think that it's something phenomenon that has just cropped up it has always been so that Satan picks on those whom God has chosen to do his will he, he puts his most excruciating pain upon them and he uses his greatest powers against them he, he lifts up their temptations he he offers them things that regular folks never even know because it brings him joy to bring somebody down whom God has chosen. Right now, somebody listening to me doesn't understand that the reason why you are having it so hard is because God had a plan for your life. And the devil knows it. So he works on you much harder. Samson is in Gaza, sees the prostitute. Why in the world would a man of God do this? But he goes and, and he's in her place. And what he doesn't know and what you need to know is that while you are going against God, there are people who are watching you. They don't act like they know you, but they're watching you. Hey, how you doing? They don't want to give you a hint. But when God has put his hands on you, there's something about you that you can't hide. You didn't hear me. The microphone went out just then, and you didn't hear what I said. When, when God has a purpose for your life, there's something about you that stands out. And when it stands out, people will treat you differently. Sometimes it will help you. Other times when the devil comes after you, it will be the greatest burden of your life. But they're always watching. Not only are people watching. What I've discovered is that it is not God trying to catch us doing wrong. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The one who's watching you is the devil. He is the accuser of the brethren. He's not the, he's not the one on your side, so he tells you stuff to do. Then he sends every Christian in town to the place where you're in trouble. Don't you think that it was some accident that in this place where Samson had gone to be with this woman whom he sh never should have touched, that the people didn't know. In fact, the Philistines got together and they said, hey, I knew he couldn't last 20 years. You thought he'd never break down again, didn't, didn't I tell you? He'd be back right down there in Gaza. See that house right down there with that funny looking roof? He's in there. And guess what? In the morning when the sun rises, we will have enough forces around that house to take him. He's a dead man. So let him have the night. I'm going to tell you how good God is. In a house of ill repute, Samson is asleep, unconscious. And all of a sudden, something rouses him. Do you think it was the devil? <laughs> he would have gotten great joy in having a sunrise capture. Who was it then? And I know some of you have to stretch your brain to figure this out because you think God is so vengeful that as soon as you do something wrong, God is after you. And what I've been trying to tell you for this series is that God is not against you. It is divine power that chases you trying to bring you back to where you belong God is not trying to force you out God is trying to bring you in he will do things that you can't imagine to try to get you back before it's eternally too late so at midnight something shakes Samson you can think what you think I know what shook him there may have been a dream that woke him up, but I know who sent the dream because God is always looking to try to bring you back, to, to let you live within the power of his love. And so the man wakes up for no reason at all. And when he wakes up, he senses what's going on. You can't have all those thousands of people around without being aware of it. I don't know what does it. Maybe somebody stepped on a twig. Maybe some horse in the corner said, <laughs> Samson said, wait a minute, something going on. So he leaves the house knowing that 
Thousands of eyes are on him. And when he gets to the gate of Gaza, it's locked. But if you're Samson, and if God loves you enough to shake you awake at midnight, then that same power will give you the strength to get out of the town. So while the doors are locked, he does not open them. He bricks them up. Not just the doors, but the hinges. Those things that hold the doors to the pinnings of the doors. Up. Out of the places where they've been digged. And he puts them over his shoulders and walks up the hill with the gates. And somebody wakes up. To, hey, 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 hey. Who is that? Well, that's, is that, that's not a person. I don't, I don't know what that is. Are those the gates? Is, is, is somebody under them? They're moving up the hill. Yeah, I told you. We shouldn't have waited till morning. We should have caught him now. Now, folks, stick with me, because I got to show you something that, that, will, that will tend to uh, build up my former declaration. When you turn against God, you are out of your mind. If that happens to you, if you pick up the gates and go free, when you get home, don't you want to say, Lord, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, forgive me. I messed up. But after that deliverance, I know you got me out of there. I'm going to stay with you for the rest of my days. But it is not long after that that Samson spies a woman in the Vale of Sorek. Her name means devourer. Maybe you ought to check into the meaning of the names of people. A woman named Devourer. But he goes to her. And they begin to have genteel conversation. And the Philistines learn that he has an eye for her, so they come to her. It doesn't seem that she's a Philistine woman, but someone from another culture. And they say, we will pay you to find out what makes him strong. Oh, forgive me, but I... See, I don't, I don't read this stuff like ink stains on paper. I ask God to take me to the place. I feel like I've been there when she was telling him, you know, you're a good-looking man. I've heard about you, but the half was not told. Not only are you strong, do you mind if I touch your bicep? <laughs> Nobody said you were good-looking. Why don't we uh, get to know each other? What makes you so strong? I've always wondered that. Is there any way I could get you to tell me what it really is? He said, oh, sure. A woman like you? <laughs> I'll tell you anything. Well, why don't you tell me right? Why don't we start off this relationship with something that builds trust between us? Why don't you tell me something you've never told anybody before? Why don't you tell me what it is that would make you as weak as a regular man? He said, that's simple. All you got to do is get some uh, green lengths and tie me up with them. They've never been used before, and I'll turn into a natural man. <laughs> now, folks, when she ties you up while you're asleep, This is not rocket science. <laughs> when she ties you up, when you wake up, I don't know. Uh, when she says the Philistines are upon you, and you know, no problem. You break out of the stuff and say, "What's going on, girl?" I know you ain't called these folk in here, did you? But by now they're gone. She said, "But, but you lied to me. How can we have trust, Samson?" How can we ever build a relationship if you're not going to tell me the truth? Come on. 
right now. Why don't you? Do, well, I tell you what, don't do it now. Let me just take care of you for a few days. I could be more explicit, but you couldn't handle it. I could tell you what happened after that. I, I know what happens when the devil blends his wisdom with the intent of somebody who does not love God. You can be in the presence of someone who has more power than you believe, not because they are smart, but because the devil is using them. You got to be careful with whom you associate. There are people who are looking regular, but they are not. He says, how about two new ropes? She ties him up with that. The Philistines are upon you. Cracks them and breaks them and gets up. And then eventually he gets tired. If you continue to play games with ungodly people, your resolve will evaporate. Tell you what you do. In fact, this is... I've never told anybody this before. If you take the seven locks of my hair, and you see that weave you got over there? Weave my hair like you do cloth. And then put the pin in there and, and kind of lock me into that, that whole mechanism over there. And if you call anybody then, I'll be as weak as I can be. And sure enough, he can't be asleep. It's too, too uncomfortable for him. But after she has stuck in all of the mechanism and his hair is completely locked, she says, the Philistines be upon you. And he, by his hair, the man's got strong hair. <laughs> by his hair, he pulls up the mechanism. And she says, but, but sweetheart, you lied to me. How are we ever going to love each other? And you think this is ridiculous, but I believe somebody is listening to me right now who is just, who is just as foolish. Who has let somebody get way into their lives. And then one day it happens. He's too tired. She wakes him up and, sweetheart, I, you know, let me, let me just massage you. I just... Oh, these, are, these muscles are amazing. <laughs> tell me. Tell me, baby. <laughs> I'm starting to think it may have something to do with your hair. You know, that last thing you told me. I thought we were getting warm. We'll be close. You say, well, I'll tell you what it is. If you... Uh, if you cut my hair. That's the last thing that connected him to his vow. He was hanging by a thread until then. And now that's gone. She puts him to sleep on her lap. And while he is asleep, she calls in someone with a razor. Ah! They take that, the locks of his hair and begin to shave him off. He says, all right, let's check him now. And she said, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he says, I will rise and shake myself like I did before. I will get up and be as strong as I was before. But when he gets up, That something has left him. It is more than he imagined. He did not know that he had hung by the last thread and cut it, and now he had nothing. Listen, one of my favorite writers says that if somebody had made his hair be cut without his will, he would have been, he would have been just as strong. The power was not in the hair. The power was in the commitment to God. When you break every thread that connects you to God, it is then that you've given away the best thing that you have. And don't fool yourself. Sometimes when you think someone loves you because of what you look like or because of your talents or your skills, it is none of the above. It is your connection with God that makes you attractive. And what that person wants most is to play with that connection. It's something they don't have, but something you have. And there you are cutting every connection you have with God. And they took that man away and gouged out his eyes and put him at a grinder 
and he ground grain and they laughed at him until that day you remember what happened he had been grinding corn as his hair grew back but I want to tell you something it was not the regrowth of the hair it was his recommitment to God See, don't, don't, don't reduce religion to icons. This is not a cartoon. This is not some strange story you saw on HBO. This is the power of God in action. So as that man grinds corn, he finally comes to his senses and says, God, I can't see with these eyes anymore, but my heart has new eyesight. I can see now that the only thing I ever had was you. And I cut you off. And I want to beg of you, Father, if I never do anything for you again, just forgive me for what I've done. And he recommitted his life to God. And as his hair grew back, it had little, I believe, to do with the recommitment. But one day they took him down to play the final sport in that temple where Dagon was, the fish god. A God that looked like half fish and half man. And on that day, says one of my favorite writers, it was no longer a contest between Samson and the Philistines. It was a contest between the fish God and the God of heaven. Listen, the only real thing you can do with your life is to put it on the side of God. The only lasting thing, the only positive thing that you can do the only meaningful thing that you can do with your life is to put it on God's side this man finally does it and you remember what happened he goes out and they are laughing and they say look the powerful man who wounded and killed so many of our people look at him now and they brought him out there were 3,000 people on the roof and he said I'm, I'm, I'm feeling woozy I'm a little dizzy. Could you take me to that place I've heard you've got where I could just lean on the pillars? He knew that they were close enough together so that he could get his hands on both of them. It was the primary support of that temple. He had just enough space to push the pillars. And he decided, no matter what happens to me, I will die obeying my God. I will die trying to get back some of the, of the luster that I took away from his name. And he pushed the pillars, and it came tumbling down. And I know some of you say it was suicide. And some of you say, well, if that's the way he went out, how can you give us his story and try to make us come to God? And I direct you to Hebrews, the 11th chapter. It is a place where the greatest heroes for God have their names recorded. When you get to verse 32, you will find in a list of names the name of sex. Join us next time for more Breath of Life. Walter Pearson believes that Jesus Christ is the answer to every problem you face.